start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our victory in Jesus. We thank you, God, that you reign, that you are the final authority of all things. We praise you, God, for your goodness in our lives, how you care for us and watch over us. Lord, we thank you for how you've been working um, to strengthen churches across our land. And God, we thank you that even in the midst of the difficulty that the world's going through, Lord, we, um, we seem to be seeing record numbers of people turning back to the church. So God, we thank you that in the midst of difficulty, um, you're working in people's lives. And so God, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you that you preserve your people. Lord, we think of our Christian brothers and sisters all over the world who um, live in countries that are not as kind to Christianity as ours is. And Lord, we pray that you would strengthen them, that you would guide them, that you would give them wisdom. Lord, as they might feel tired and worn out and exhausted, and they might feel like giving up some days, we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them as only you can. We pray, Lord, that you would affirm their faith. And Lord, we pray that they would cling to passages that remind them that you are coming soon to deliver them. God, I pray that as we look at these seven churches, that, Lord, we would continue to ask ourselves, which of these seven churches best describes us as a church? Lord, help us as we read through the, the church of Philadelphia today, that, Lord, we would look to see where we're similar. Lord, look to see where we might be different. God, we pray that at the end of this series, we would be able to um, affirm this is where we are as a church, and this is where we need to go as a church. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to this text. Um, Lord, help us to move through it humbly. There's a couple of weird verses here that are going to be a little tricky to get through. And so, God, we just pray that you would guide us in this time. I pray that you would speak to me and speak through me. That, Lord, you would open all of our hearts and our ears that we might hear your spirit. We pray for those who aren't with us today because of sickness and illness. We pray, Lord, that you would bring, the, bring them a healing touch. That, Lord, you would do a good work in their lives. And, Lord, we thank you for this day. We praise you for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you have your Bibles with you, we'll be in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is to come upon the world, the whole world, to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so let's start with a little background information on the city of Philadelphia. And I guess I should be very clear about this. We are not talking about Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yeah. So yeah. some of you who thought that that city was much more ancient than it is, no, we're talking about um, uh, Philadelphia in Asia Minor, which if you look at your map is in modern day Turkey. Um, the city of Philadelphia was founded in 147 BC by Italus II of Pergamum. Um, Philadelphia is the youngest of the seven cities that we'll be talking about in Revelation. And the city is nicknamed after, or the city is named after Italus' nickname, Italus Philadelphos, which means the one who loves his brother. Um, Italus had a brother named Eumenes. They got along very well. He very much loved his brother. And so they gave him the nickname, hey, you're a guy who likes his brother a lot. Which hopefully everyone should always love their brother and give him plenty of, plenty of gifts and riches. Um, anyway, uh, Italus' purpose with Philadelphia was that it would be a doorway to the east for missionary work for the Greek culture. He wanted Greek culture to go beyond um, the boundaries of where Alexander had taken it, and he wanted it to go all the way across the world. The only fault, pun intended, of Philadelphia is that it was built on a fault line. So it was nicknamed the City of Earthquakes, because they always had them. So anyway, back to our passage. In the letter to Philadelphia, Jesus receives his longest title of all the letters. 
He is the one who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. How many of you guys have ever thought that you had a long name, and you hated trying to squeeze it on the line? Randy's name is so long on the, bull, on the attendance sheet, it's just Randy W., because I can't fit it all in it. Imagine having this as your name. What's your name? I'm the holy and true one. The one who holds the key of David. What I open, no one can shut. What I shut, no one can open. Well, let's break that title down. So first it says that Jesus is holy. What does that mean? Well, we often think about holiness as we don't do evil things. Or there are sins that we don't do. But as we've seen in the book of Revelation, it kind of corrects that thinking and says, Sure, holiness is avoiding sin. But holiness also means that you're busy doing the work of God. It's both of those things. So to simply not be evil or to simply avoid doing bad things isn't necessarily biblical holiness. It is that, but it's also doing the will of God the Father. So Jesus, as he tells us in the book of John, perfectly says what God the Father would say, and he perfectly does what God the Father would say. He is the Holy One. We also see that Jesus is true. We've seen in each of these letters that each of these churches is surrounded by this pagan culture that's trying to pull them from following Jesus and entice them with things like um, sexual morality and idolatry and the priorities and patterns and perversions of this world. And so there's this constant, um, uh, there's this constant pressure in the, in the community to just give up on Christianity and just do whatever the world does. But we're reminded here that Jesus is the true one. Jesus is the one who defines what it truly means to be a human. He's the perfect example of humanity. He shows us how humans should act and how they should speak and what they should think. He shows us perfectly what it means to worship God, perfectly what it means to love other people, and perfectly what it means to steward God's creation. He's the source of all that's true and the source of all that's right. He's perfectly trustworthy and reliable. We also find out that Jesus holds the key of David. Well, what does that even mean? This is kind of cool. This is a, a direct quote from Isaiah 22, 22. In that passage, the Lord is speaking a prophecy against the Secretary of State for Judah. No, don't tell that joke. That'd be inappropriate. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I was going to say, anyway, I digress. I digress. Anyway, the Secretary of State has become extremely corrupt, and the Lord says, I'm going to forcibly remove, remove you. I'm going to strip away your robe, your sash, and the key of David. And there's another guy, guy named Eliakim who um, all these things will be given to him. And the Lord tells us in Isaiah 22 that Eliakim will love the people of Judah in the same way that a father would love his children. And so clearly the Lord wants this guy to be in charge. And one of the things that Eliakim will receive is a key of David. And this is kind of a symbol of power. So think back to in the end of Genesis when Joseph rises in power, he gets the king's ring. And basically, this means that whatever Joseph does is in the Pharaoh's name. So basically, Joseph is kind of like Pharaoh. He has the Pharaoh's authority, and as long as he has that ring, he can make decisions in his name. That's what the key of David represents. It represents a final authority. So whatever Eliakim says, as long as he has that key, whether it's literal or symbolic, they have to do what he says. He is the final authority. So now, Jesus takes that story and applies it to himself. I hold the key of David, meaning Jesus has the final authority. He is the final source of truth. What Jesus says goes, and his plans cannot be thwarted. But then we get to this weird part. What Jesus opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. What in the world does that mean? Well, it could mean a couple things. Maybe it means that when Jesus opens the door of salvation... He can open it to the non-Jewish Gentiles if he wants to, and nobody can shut that door. Once Jesus says, I want the whole world to be saved, no one can be like, well, Jesus, I know you said you don't want the whole world to be saved, but let's talk about different people groups that should be saved. And she says, no, nope, I've opened the door for everyone. You can't shut this. But Jesus, have you thought about people in this age group? We probably shouldn't. Jesus says, no, nope, I've opened it for them. But Jesus, what about these types of people? Well, I've opened it for them. We're not shutting it. But it also says that those who Jesus wants to shut the door, he has that authority. So maybe it's he's opened the door of salvation. It could also mean that Jesus is with the key opened the city of this new Jerusalem. That all people are free to come into the kingdom of God when Jesus calls to the kingdom of God. Which one is it? And my answer is this. I don't often say this, Shelby. 
I don't know. And I'm not going to try to make the text say something that I don't think it speaks to. Because whether Jesus is talking about the open door of salvation or the open door of the new Jerusalem, I think the point's still the same. That Jesus truly desires people to be saved. I think either way we get at that idea. And so Jesus has opened the door for the whole world to be saved, to be to drawn into the kingdom of God. And nobody can shut it on anyone else. As Ephesians says, um, all barriers have been removed for salvation. So if you go back to the text, and in verse 8, Jesus says, I've seen your deeds. He said this to Ephesus, he said this to Thyatira, and to Sardis. But when he said it to those three churches, they were always bad things. I know your deeds, you guys aren't doing what you're supposed to be doing. But here, when he says he sees their deeds, he just has words of praise. He says that they have faithfully kept his word. They've not denied his name, and they put their faith into practice. This sounds pretty good. In fact, Philadelphia is one of two churches that receives no kind of remark at all of rebuke. What we do know from the Church of Philadelphia, and most historians would agree with this, the Church of Philadelphia is a very small church. It's just kind of a, I don't even know how many people would be there, but it's, it seems to not be nearly as large as the other churches. And because of their small size, it almost seems like the pressure is more on them. There's not as many people to kind of diffuse this persecution they're going through. It becomes more personal because of their size. And Jesus tells us that, yes, they've been doing all these good things. However, they're just getting worn out from it. They're, they're, they're just tired and exhausted from all the persecution and difficulty they're going through. So Jesus once again mentions, as he mentioned with the church of Smyrna, that they are up against the synagogue of Satan. Now, we shouldn't understand that as a cult to Satan that existed back then. That would be too explicit. This is more subtle. The synagogue of Satan, and John chapter 8 would be a great chapter to go back to. Because Jesus addresses this when he's talking to a, a crowd of Jews that secretly want to kill him. And he says, you know, your guys' as true father is the devil because your actions and your thoughts reflect his actions and thoughts. And so the synagogue of Satan refers to a group of people whose priority is the same harm and destruction as the evil one's priority. They rejected Jesus as the king of all things, and they, they're trying to establish themselves. The Zondervan NIV commentary describes it this way. It appears to describe a Jewish element that vehemently denied Jesus as the Messiah and that actively persecuted others who made this claim. What's interesting is when we talk about the Antichrist in our Western culture, we typically think of some final authority, some final governmental power at the end of time who will be possessed by Satan and will launch a huge persecution of the church. But it's interesting to read how the Bible uses that, especially in the book of 1 John. 1 John says that an Antichrist is anybody who says that Jesus is not the Messiah. Anyone who says that Jesus and God the Father are not related or connected in any way. And so the synagogue of Satan, according to 1 John, would be made up of people who are anti-Christian and anti-Christ. They want nothing to do with Jesus as the Messiah. Now, with this group of Jewish thinking, maybe it might be good to say that this might not represent every Jewish person at the time of its writing. But there does seem to be, in Philadelphia, a decent group of um, Jewish people who have risen up against Gentiles coming to faith. One thing I learned this week in my reading was in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 14, there's a passage that refers to Jesus taking all the Jewish people and lining them up and then bringing all the Gentiles of the world before them and forcing the Gentiles to bow down before them and confess that the Jewish people are God's city, or the Jewish people are the true city of God. And so maybe it's that verse that launches this mentality that we bump into in the Gospels and in the book of Acts and in some of Paul's writings, where the Jewish people were excluding Gentiles from salvation. We see in Acts that whenever Paul would go to different cities to share Jesus, a group of Jews, I think from Thessalonica, would follow him and try to persecute him and kill him so that he couldn't spread the message. We see even with the disciples, when Jesus is like, hey, I need you guys to go share um, the gospel message with different ethnicities, the disciples are like, do we have to? And Jesus is like, yes, you have to. And they're like, well, I guess. And one of my, it's, a, it's a horrible line. Peter goes up to Cornelius' house and he's like, you know, I'm not allowed to be here because of my law, which isn't true. It's not an Old Testament law. But he says, the only reason I'm here to talk to you is because God told me I had to. 
thanks, Peter. Um, have some finger food. I don't know. Probably not a good way to meet someone. I'm only talking to you because God told me to. Not good people skills, my friends. But anyway, um, the New Testament teaches us that the reality is that anyone who puts their faith in Jesus and trusts his forgiveness of their sins, that he has done everything necessary to save them on the cross, and that he is the true Messiah, anyone can be saved. Remember what John 3.16 says, that God so loved a certain ethnicity? It doesn't say that, does it? God so loved the world. It has nothing to do with the geography of where you live or a biology of who your great ancestor was. It's anybody who is trusted in Jesus as the anointed king can be saved. And on the flip side, anyone that rejects Jesus as God's anointed king, they've also rejected God the Father. Now, it is true that we do believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but there's a huge caveat to that. We believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob revealed in Jesus Christ. If you remove Jesus Christ from that equation, that is not the same God that we serve. You can say, yes, it is. Our God is a triune God made up of three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If you reject that creed, you are no longer serving the same God that we serve. That is not the Christian faith. And so there's a group of Jews who are vehemently denying that Jesus is the Messiah. And the gospel has gone out to the Gentiles, and they're beginning to have put the same faith in God. And at this point in history, the two religions have not completely separated from each other. There's, there's still some holdings on on both sides. And so this group of anti-Christian, anti-Christ Jews are saying, we reject you and we're, we're preventing you from hearing the gospel, and we don't want any part of you. And they're persecuting these Gentiles who are putting their faith in the Lord. Now what's interesting in the very clever bit of irony is notice what it says. Jesus tells the Philadelphian church that he will bring these anti-Christian Jews before them and he will force the anti-Christian, anti-Christ Jews to bow before the Gentiles of the church of Philadelphia and confess something. Now notice, it's interesting what they confess. The confession is the anti-Christian, anti-Christ Jews will say, okay, we confess Jesus has loved you guys very much. But notice what they don't confess. Even at this point, this almost this final judgment type idea, they still don't confess that Jesus is the Messiah. We'll confess that whoever this Jesus character is, he likes you. But we're, according to the text, it doesn't seem like they're going to confess, even in that moment, who Jesus is. Maybe revealing a stubborn heart. So Jesus tells them that the Philadelphian church, that they have endured very patiently. They have clung to Jesus and they have refused to turn away from him. And in verse 10, he tells them that since they have kept his command, that he is going to keep them in the hour of trial. Well, this is a very difficult passage that we have to maybe ask some questions about. One, what is this hour of trial that it talks about? Two, what does it mean for Jesus to keep them from the hour of trial? And three, what does it mean that he's going to test the inhabitants of the world, those who live on the earth? Well, the last one's easy. It, in the book of Revelation, this idea of those who live on the earth is used seven times. And in each instance, it's always referring to unbelievers. So apparently, whatever this trial is, this trial is specifically for those who have not put their faith in the Lord. Well, what does it mean for Jesus to keep them from the hour of trial. And this is where the verse gets kind of tricky to translate because if you look at verse 10, notice uh, it uses the same word in two different places. Since you have kept my commands to endure patiently, I will also keep you from trial. And so I would assume, interpreting this, that since the same Greek word is used in the same sentence, however we translate it at the beginning of the sentence is probably intended how we translate it at the end. But what does the Greek word for keep mean? Well, it can mean up to three things. One, it means to keep someone from injury. So like if, if Jeffrey was riding his bike and going down a hill, I might run and grab him and rip him off of his bike so he doesn't get hurt. I have kept him from safety. It could also mean that you guard someone or watch over them. So I know Evelyn's getting that, that, age, that dangerous age where boys might come and knock him. I might watch like a soldier all the time just standing at the foot of her bed, just constantly plotting, 
constantly cleaning my gun, which is a little pop gun that Jeffrey has. So it, I would use soap. It would not be effective. Although it does hurt. We shot each other with it the other day. It does hurt. And it's true. But anyway, maybe it means that just this sentry watch. But it also can mean observe or to just kind of watch over something. So which one of those best fits? Since you, Let's go with the first one. Since you have kept my commandments from injury, I will keep you from injury in this trial. Well, we can understand what it means for Jesus to keep us from injury. But what does it mean for the church to keep God's command from injury? That doesn't really, that doesn't sound good. Well, let's go to the second one. Since you have watched over like a guardian my commandments, I will watch over you like a guardian in the trial to come. Well, again, that makes sense on Jesus' end, but how do we keep God's commandments? How do we guard them like a sentry or a, a watchman? We go with the last one. Since you have observed my commandments, I will observe you in this time of trial. But that makes more sense for the church because we understand what it means to observe God's rules, God's law. But when we say that God just observes us, it just makes it look like he's watching us from a distance. And that doesn't really line up with the care and concern that God shows when his people go through difficulty. Well, which one is it? And the reality is, once again, I'm going to say, I don't know. This is a very tricky verse to translate. What I think we can do is say this. Are there implications from this verse that we can understand? And the answer is yes. The first implication that I think we can get from this is notice Jesus says, I will keep you from the hour of trial. But notice in verse 12, he says, for those who overcome. That kind of implies that in this time of trial, guess what's going to happen? They're going to go through a bit of it. And that really doesn't surprise us, though, does it? Because... As we read through Scripture, is there really any major character in Scripture who doesn't go through difficulty? Moses does, Abraham does, David does, Ruth does, um, Jeremiah the prophet does, Jonah does. Even Jesus himself goes through difficulty. So is it uncommon for people to go through difficulty in the Bible? It's not uncommon, uncommon at all. And so when we see this passage in Revelation, it does appear that these people are going to go through a bit of difficulty as well. Whatever this trial is that the world will go through, the church will be there through it. But notice this as well. This idea of Jesus keeping them through trial doesn't mean that God puts his people in difficulty and just says, you know, I'm just going to watch to see how this plays out. I'm just going to kind of observe passive-aggressively. No, it's very clear that as the church goes through this, God will be there with them the entire time, strengthening them. And a very interesting thing about the church, and we've talked about this before, when things are the hardest for the church, guess what happens to the church? It gets stronger. It gets stronger. The church grows faster under persecution. Our theology comes better. Evangelism. You would, you would think this would be the complete opposite. But when people are persecuted for Christianity, for some crazy reason, they feel more strengthened to tell people about Jesus than when they're not being persecuted. And so it seems in this passage that when Jesus says, you'll go through difficulty, but I'm going to keep you through this, that although this difficulty might negatively affect the world, this, the ones who follow after the evil one, for the church, it's going to strengthen the church and build the church and cause the church to grow like crazy. Thirdly, the first implication is that the church goes through difficulties and will continue to go through difficulties. Two, in the midst of any difficulty, God is always with his people. And thirdly, we see that this judgment, the trial, the wrath of God isn't something that's always necessarily withheld until the end of time, or the eschaton. If you were to read the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, Paul says like five times back to back, he says the wrath of God is God just lets people do whatever they want. That's And if you've ever gotten in trouble, how many guys have ever gotten in trouble and that's what your punishment was? Your parents said, okay, do what you want. That's the scariest thing ever, isn't it? Because I know if I get maybe a spank on the tush, I'm going to recover from that. If I get grounded, okay, they'll forget about it. and They'll say, why don't you come do this anyway? But if they say, why don't you just do what you want then? Usually as a kid, when I do what you want, I was always like, no. Because if you tell me I can do that, I know something bad is going to happen. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says that's God's wrath. In the Old Testament, it may have been these big elaborate things. But in the New Testament, it seems like it shifted to God. It's just like, you know what? 
try to do things on your own, see how well that goes, or, you know, I'm just going to let you have your own way, I'm going to let you follow your own behaviors, your own patterns, your own priorities, your own instincts, and see how productive that is. And so when we talk about God's wrath, this doesn't necessarily imply when Jesus returns. It can imply that God just saying, you know what, you, you wanted a world without me? Okay, you have no idea what that means. But let's, let's see how this works out. Let's, let's see how this experiment that you want works out. Maybe that's what it means when it says that I'm coming soon. Maybe it doesn't necessarily imply his return. Maybe it's just this Old Testament idea that when Jesus shows up, judgment happens. Jesus tells them, starting in verse 11, that they need to hold on to their crown so that no one can take it. And we talked before about the crown that um, Jesus is referring to. It's not this gold diadem like a king would wear. It's these little, cute little braided, flowery wreaths. And it would be a sign of victory in the Olympic Games. That, you know, hey, Janet's wearing one of those cutesy wreaths. What does that mean? It means Janet's victorious. She ran the 403 seconds. I would pay to see that, Janet. I don't know if you can do that. I don't know if you can. I'm at one time she could do that in high school. She's got every record. No, no, she's got a whole wall of records. Anyway, I digress. But it means that you have been victorious in your athletic adventure. And so here, that is the crown that these churches will receive for being victorious or for trusting in the Lord. They overcome. They've been victorious over the world they live in. So what does it mean when he says, don't let anyone take your crown? Does that mean that the devil can take our salvation from us? No. Does it mean that someone else can take our salvation from us? No. You know, as a Wesleyan, I often hear people say, you guys think that people can lose their salvation. And I would say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You don't lose your salvation. I lose my keys. In fact, thinking about it now, I think I lost my keys yesterday. Shelly will find them. That's why she's here. We don't, you don't wake up one day and be like, oh man, I thought I was saved, but I woke up this morning and I have no idea what, what, where my salvation is. It's, is it in the, my pants I wore yesterday? Is it in the glove box? We, you don't lose your salvation. <laughs> now, it's very clear from Scripture that you can walk away from it. And that's why I love this, old, this biblical idea of walking with Jesus. Because walking with Jesus does imply that you can stop walking with Jesus. That you can choose to quit going with him. You can walk away from the Lord, which if you say, well, that's impossible. Read the book of Malachi. It specifically says the priesthood has chosen to walk away from God. So the idea that's probably being stressed here is Jesus is saying, as you're living in the midst of this pagan culture, that's trying to lead you away from Jesus, trying to get you to deny that he's the Messiah. Don't let them pressure you to throw your crown away. Hold tight to it. Then he goes on to say what happens to those who overcome this temptation to uh, give up. He says that they will become a pillar in the temple of my God. Now one of the cool things, and you guys will remember from the beginning of the service, what was the nickname of Philadelphia? Not the city of brotherly love, it was nicknamed the city of? Earthquake. 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 I think Shelby said it first. Shelby said it first. We'll give her credit. It's the city of earthquakes. And in these earthquakes, what's interesting is, even if the whole town was decimated, there would still be one structure that would stand. These huge columns. Have you guys ever seen pictures of old ruins and their columns are still standing to this day? These pillars are powerful. Not powerful. These pillars are, um, oh man, what word am I thinking of? Engineering feats of ingenuity. These things stand up like crazy. So when Jesus says to these people that live in a city of earthquakes, you guys are going to be like pillars. That would ring a bell. Ooh, there's an idea of permanence there. There's an idea that once we cling to Jesus, and as long as we're walking with him, nothing's, we might be shaken, we might go through difficulty, but our faith is firm and secure in the Lord, that nothing's going to destroy our salvation. It also reinforces this imagery that Paul uses that you and I are the temple of God. That when we cling to Jesus, you know, God doesn't live in this sanctuary. Even when Solomon builds the temple, remember what he says in his prayer? God does not live in a house built by men, but the temple that God lives in is me and you and all of us together. And what is it Jesus says where a new building is dedicated to the Lord? I live in that building and hope they show up on Sunday. He says where two or three people are gathered. I'm there as well. So you and I are the temple. And Jesus says when we cling to Jesus, we become God's temple. And notice this. 
We never have to leave it. In the Old Testament, you would go kill your animal. You might get to eat part of it when they get done cooking it. But you're going to go home. Here, he says, you never have to leave the temple again. You can just hang out all day. Then notice what else he says. That he will write the name of my God, my God's city, the new Jerusalem. And he, Jesus says, I will write a new name on them. When, a, when, when an employee of the city back in this day would do a really good job, one of the ways they would reward them is they would say, we want everyone to know how great of a job Joe Bob did. So we're going to write Joe Bob's name on this pillar. And when people see that, they're going to say, wow, this pillar belongs to Joe Bob. Joe Bob belongs to that pillar. And there would be a sense of permanence there, a sense of um, just clinginess, if you will. And so in our passage, when it says that God will write his name on people, there's this idea that there's a, a permanence of salvation for those who cling and walk with Jesus. That if you're walking with Jesus as you've called to, if you've taken off those old filthy robes that we read about last week and wear the new robes, that God will inscribe his name on you and he will keep you safe through all these difficult things. You will be his, he will be yours. Then Jesus says, we'll also put, for good measure, we're going to write the name of the new Jerusalem on you as well. Again, showing that you belong here. You're part of this city. You have citizenship in the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know, I have no idea what time we started. So I, I was like, if I have time, I'm going to say just a little quick aside. You guys are here. It's fine. We'll just go ahead and do it. So perhaps a quick note on the New Jerusalem. I heard a pastor one time, and I won't say who it is, although you've probably heard of him. I heard a pastor one time say that when everything is said and done, there's going to be the new heaven and the new earth. And he's like, how does that work? Do we go to the new heaven? Do we go to the new earth? And he said, here's the answer. You can teleport back and forth between the two as you see fit. And I was like, well, if you can go in God's presence in this new heaven, why in the world would you leave that? And if you did leave God's presence to go to the new earth, would that imply that you're rejecting the world? I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Well, the reality is, when we understand what, how the Bible defines heaven, I think it makes more sense. So... Revelation is very clear that when everything is said and done, Jesus is going to redeem the earth, transform the earth, and the earth will become this huge city of God, the new Jerusalem. What will that look like? The Bible tries to describe it, but you get the impression that John's like, you know what, I can't even describe this well. So it's kind of like this, kind of like this. It's beautiful. So when we talk about the new heaven, though, often when we talk about heaven, we think in terms of, okay, when someone dies, they go to heaven which they, that is true, they go to the presence of God. But the way that the Bible describes heaven is a little more rich than just some distant realm that exists out of there somewhere. Think back to Genesis 28, if you will, with me. There's a young man named Jacob who's trying to run from everybody in his life, and he's trying to run from God. And he has a dream, and in his dream he sees this huge stairway to heaven. And then he wrote a song about it. That's not true. That's not true. Led Zeppelin did. But it's not even... Anyway, anyway, I digress. Anyway, I digress. Angels are going up this stairway. Angels are coming down. And at the top of the stairway, he sees the presence of the Lord. And when he wakes up, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, that was the house of God. What does he say? He says this, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And then he renames it Bethel, which means house of God. So Jacob teaches us something very early in Scripture that we're meant to keep in our brains. Wherever God's presence dwells is heaven. Now I know that's a very different way of thinking about it. But everywhere that God's presence thickly resides is his dwelling place. God doesn't sit on a physical throne with a physical body. Jesus reminds us time and time again that God is a... Spirit. He is incorporeal. That's why it's such a big deal when Jesus becomes flesh that we can see and touch and um, hear and all the five senses Jesus. So this idea of heaven is that God fills every... God occupies every available space that he desires to fill that is available. And so that includes this realm of heaven where he dwells it involves the earth. It involves places like the Holy of Holies, the Garden of Eden, Mount Sinai in the time of Moses. So 
when this, at the end of all things, when Jesus comes, this earth realm that you and I live on, this heaven realm where God dwells, will become one and the same. They will overlap. Now, that doesn't mean that God will exclusively live in this heaven realm that you and I think of. And it doesn't mean that he will exclusively be on the earth. God occupies all available space that he chooses to occupy. So to be on earth is to be in God's presence. God is everywhere he chooses to be. End of the side. Back to the text. All right, so then Jesus closes out by saying that he will also write a new name, his new name, on each person. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago because Jesus said that he's going to give each person a little white tablet or a white stone that's going to have a new name written on it. And we said that some people interpret that as, I'm going to get a new name. Hopefully my new name would be Awesome Guy, Amazing One. Mm -hmm. Or we said probably that could also refer to that Jesus is going to give them a white stone with a new name that is a new revelation of his name. And so when we come back to this idea that Jesus is going to reveal almost his final name, because notice every time God does something in the Bible, he tells us a new name for himself, doesn't he? And so it would make sense that when everything is said and done, and Jesus completely saves in every way imaginable, and completely removes evil from his kingdom, it would make sense, wouldn't it, that he'd be like, okay, here's my final description. This is the final way that summarizes everything I've done from the creation of the world to redeeming the world today. It would make sense. So maybe that's the new name, this final name of, re of revealing his character. Or it could be what God the Father calls Jesus. Jesus is an earth name. It's made up of um, Hebrew word letters. It's a Hebrew name. What did God the Father call Jesus before Jesus became named Jesus? Maybe this is the name that will be revealed to us. Jesus is like, hey, you guys called me this. My real name is whatever it is, and we'd be able to understand. Who knows? My answer is, I don't know. We, hopefully, hopefully you will, you'll overcome with me, and we'll find out together. So as we close our sermon, I think the question is, what, what characterizes this church? And you know, if we go back through our list of churches, Ephesus was a church, they were busy doing churchy things, but they weren't living the life of love they were called to live. Smyrna was very much living the kingdom of God lifestyle, even when it was difficult. Pergamum, they continued to follow the patterns, priorities, and perversions of the surrounding culture, but guess what? They still claimed, oh, we're following Jesus. Thyatira, they were listening to false teaching, which was affecting their spiritual journey. Sardis was the church celebrating their past ministry, but they were doing very little to advance the kingdom of God in the present. Philadelphia, we could say, is an exhausted and worn out church, but... They're living faithfully for Jesus in the midst of intense persecution. Now, I challenge, and I always often say this, when we talk about the, the Western church, especially the American church, we're a very comfortable church. Um, I, will not, I will not even pretend to say that we, we understand persecution in the same way that Libyan Christians do or Moroccan Christians or Iraqi Christians do. But I will say this, regardless of what kind of suffering we go through in our culture, Maybe it is just peer pressure at work. You know, why don't you do this thing with us? Why don't you just quit being such a holy roller? Why don't you quit being a Bible thumber and just do this one thing? Regardless of what persecution for us looks like, we're called to be faithful to the Lord. We are called to, in the midst of pressure to turn away from Jesus as Messiah, we're called to follow him. Will that exhaust us? Absolutely. I've had jobs where I was the only Christian there, and sometimes I hated going to work because it's like, man... These guys are just going to all day taunt me about this over and over and over again. And it'd be easy to say, you know what, all right, I'm going to do this one time just to, just to get it out of the way, and then we'll be done. But Jesus says, you know, in the midst of that kind of stuff, you've got to stand firm with me. And sometimes the church will go through difficulty. But guess what happens when the church goes through difficulty? We grow. Our theology gets better. And so I know sometimes it's easy to pray, God, please don't let your church go through anything difficult. And guess what happens when the church is comfortable? A comfortable church is a weak church. But when the church faces challenge, our theology gets better. Some of the best theology of the church happens when the church is persecuted the most. Evangelism is a priority. Um, the church grows. People's lives are miraculously transformed. And so when we come to difficulty, it's easy to say, Lord, help us not to go through difficulty. But then at the same time, it's like, Lord, what would happen to the church if we did, though? 
What would the church look like if we went through a difficult time? So as we face difficulty, sometimes the temptation might be, Lord, keep me from going through a hardship. Keep me, keep me through going through something hard. But for those of you who have been around for a while, you might even say that the areas that you've grown the most as a Christian are in the difficult times. And there's always that cutesy phrase, and I don't, you know I don't like cutesy Christian phrases. I, sometimes I despise them, but this is a pretty good one where it says that things don't grow on top of the mountain. Things grow in the valley. It's not a biblical statement, but it's a very good statement. So as the church goes through difficulty and as we go through difficulty, we might be tempted to say, Lord, you know what, we're just going to, we're just going to forget following you and just do the easy way. But that's not what we've been called to do. That would be anti-Christ. That would be anti-Christian to deny Jesus. We want to follow Jesus even in the midst of intense persecution, even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of it not being convenient to be a Christian. We want to stay true to Jesus' name, and we want to follow him. So let's close, and you guys will be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage, and we thank you for the Philadelphian church. God, I don't know what heaven is going to be like, what this kingdom of God will look like. Lord, I, I hope that we'll be able to fellowship intensely with people and hear all these beautiful stories. And God, wouldn't it be cool to meet these Philadelphian Christians? There's just this, this small group of believers being heavily persecuted by the Romans, by the Jews of the area, and God, they're faithful to you. God, this, these are unsung heroes. Well, whenever we say, who's your favorite Bible character? Oh, Moses, or David, or Jesus, or Peter. No one ever says, that little church in Philadelphia. But Lord, I think they become my heroes this week because they've, they've stood the test of time. They're tired, they're worn out, they're exhausted. There's pressure to just give up. And yet they say, you know what, we're going to cling to Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would help us Lord, we live in a world that's offering so many temptations that you can't go anywhere without being lured by um, the basic instincts of humanity. So God, help us to rise above that. Jesus, you are an example of what it means to be a human. Help us to follow you, not follow what our friends tell us we should do or what media tells us to do or what the internet tells us to do or magazines or any other form of pressure outside of the Christian faith. Lord, let us stay faithful to you. Lord, help us not to give up our crowns of life. Lord, we want to be that pillar. So we cling to you. We walk with you. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to seal us with your Holy Spirit, continue to lead us in righteousness, even when the world tells us not to bother with it. Lord, let us be faithful and true. Lord, again, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters in other countries who are facing what the Bible describes as persecution. Oh, my word. God, help them not to be scared. I think I would be scared to death to face that kind of stuff. But Lord, help them to be strong. Help them to be encouraged. Help them to rally around one another. Even if it's just a small handful of believers. Lord, let them know that even if it's just two or three of them, you are there in their midst. God, help us in our culture. As maybe things might get more difficult in the future, maybe they won't. But Lord, let us remember, as hard as it is to say, that we might not want the church to be challenged or to be um, pressured. But Lord, you grow your church through that. Your people become stronger in faith through it. So Lord, whether things continue to be comfortable for the church or whether things become a little more challenging, Lord, we're not wishy-washy people that base our Christianity on how our culture tells us to think. God, we have victory in Jesus, our Savior forever. God, help us to be faithful to you empower us to be faithful to you. And God, we know that you will cling to us. We love you. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.